Okay, so. Um, okay, so we talked about type 1 error and type 2 error. Type 2 error, um, the probability of type 1 is uh, corresponds to alpha, probability of a type 2 corresponds to beta. And this is uh, probability of rejecting H0 when the null hypothesis is true. And beta is probability of not rejecting Things are over B? Uh, so the, the power is this. It's the complement of a type 2 error, which would be if type 2 error is probability of not rejecting H0 when H0 is false, the complement of that it's would be the yeah, probability of rejecting H0 when H0 is false. So it's the probability of making the correct decision of rejecting H0, okay? Of correctly rejecting H0, okay? Um, calculations for finding beta and power are actually um, a little bit tricky, okay? So calculate, calculating beta and, and power. essentially uh, finding more evidence. Is that, is that all okay? Yeah, 
power is a good thing, okay? So high power means you get a high chance of making the correct re correct decision here to reject the null hypothesis. So that square is just called the power? So the probability of this square is the power, okay? Probability of this square, this correct decision, this corresponds, this prob the probability of here, There's a, there's a whole section in the book on association and causation, all right? And, uh, and I'm just going to briefly gloss over this because I've hit a lot of these points already. And basically, um, in these tests, we might conclude uh, that there's a difference, okay? So if we rejected the null hypothesis, we conclude that there's a difference between the two means, okay? subjected to one condition and group two was subjected to a, a different set of conditions, okay? But does that mean the conditions uh, cause the difference or not, okay? That's, a, that's something entirely different that we're not, um, that the statistics itself can't tell you, okay? You have to look at whether it was an experiment or an observational study. So again, uh, only experiments can we make uh, conclusions about cause. When you were giving the example of men and women IQ difference, I mean, is that? Uh, so, uh, well, let me think of something else here. Um, yeah, so if, if we're just observing things, we can't, um, we cannot make a conclusion about cost. So if, uh, if we just observe what, um, you know, observe when uh, the rooster crows and when the sun rises, okay, I can't conclude that um, the rooster crowing causes the sun to rise, right? Um, because that's just a, an observational thing, okay? Only 
only if I do an experiment where I'm forcing a rooster somehow to crow and seeing if that affects the sun, can I, can I make a conclusion? And, and somehow in some alternate universe, if forcing the rooster to crow causes the sun to rise, then, then we can conclude that the rooster causes the sun to rise, but uh, it doesn't work that way. So only experiments, uh, can we make conclusions about cause? Okay, observational studies. There's a response variable. This is the thing that we're interested in and we measure. And then we have a bunch of explanatory variables that we're hoping um, uh, explain what's happening. Okay, so we've got a response variable. So when we're doing um, t-tests, our response variable is quantitative, it's a number, So because we're always using means and we're calculating means and standard deviations on the, uh, on the response. But our explanatory variable is categorical. Okay, we've got two categories, group one and group two. And the difference between group one and group two, that's the... Uh, um, the explanatory variable that uh, that we're using as the uh, in the t test. Okay. So for t tests, the response. Categorical uh, with two categories. Categorical variable with two categories. Okay. So in one example, it was so for our, our mice example, the response was. We measure the uh, NE concentration, and that was quantitative because we found a mean and we found a standard deviation. Uh, but the explanatory variable is categorical. Okay, we had two groups of mice. We had the control mice uh, who did. Uh, and uh, the uh, experimental mix, which was the toluene. Okay, so our categories was, did they receive toluene, or did they not get injections of toluene, okay? No injections uh, had, uh, had injections.
So going back to this idea of causation, things like that. Um, tempted to make conclusions about cause, but we have to watch out for uh, certain situations. study, you see that there is a difference between group one and group two. So this maybe you've done an experiment, okay? And there is a difference. The conclusion is that there is a difference Behold, 
group one, the average weight, uh, group one has lost weight, and group two didn't lose weight. Okay? Conclusion, there is a difference between group one, which lost weight, and group two, uh, no weight loss. Okay, so what, what's responsible? Is it the diet or is it the exercise? You can't tell, okay? With the setup of this experiment, you can't tell, all right? Because because uh, everybody in group one did the dieting and did the exercise, and everybody in group two, nobody in group two did the dieting and the exercise. So at this point, we can't, these variables, they're confounded. We can't distinguish the effect of one from the other because we did, we did a bad job setting up our experiment. Okay, if we wanted to see the effect of diet and exercise, we'd probably have to test them out one at a time, and we would subject one group to diet and the other one to no diet, and then we'd have another uh, experiment where we subject one group to exercise and another one to no exercise, or we'd have to set up the experiment entirely differently using ANOVA, where we would have different groups. One group that has diet and exercise, one group that has diet but no exercise, one group that has exercise but no diet, and one group that has neither diet nor exercise. Okay? And we'd have to set up kind of more of a, a complicated experiment. Okay? But at this point, these things, they're confounded. We don't know which one is causing the, uh, the change in, uh, in the response. If the, in group two, they did no diet and, and exercise, and they did exercise, would that still be confounding? No, because, uh, well, then, then you're really essentially exercise? only testing out diet versus no diet, right? Okay, so okay, take cause it Because if, if both of them are doing exercise, and, okay, uh, and now you're, you're just testing out whether diet or no diet makes a difference, because okay, both groups are now exercising. All right, so that's confounding variables. And then... Um, but you do know that diet and exercise make over no yeah, diet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do know that diet and exercise make over a difference. None. Over no diet and no exercise make a difference. We do know that. But can we separate the effect of diet and the effect of exercise? At this point, no. Okay, we'd have to do more, uh, more testing, or we have to completely redesign our experiment to, to do that. Okay. Uh, all right, and then the other one, uh, the book calls it spurious association. Uh, or lurking variables, okay? Right, this is, uh, this just means uh, you've observed two variables and, uh, and there's maybe an association between the two variables, but uh, one does not affect the other. What's really happening is that there's a lurking variable that affects both, okay? So uh, you, you observe uh, an association between two variables. to make a conclusion about cause, but in truth, neither variable causes the other, or there's there's really no cause, okay? In truth, uh, there's no, countries, what you will see is that countries with greater cell phone usage 
um, will have higher life expectancy. Okay? That's, a, that's a fact. But it doesn't mean that using cell phones causes you to live longer or that living longer causes you to use cell phones. <laughs> okay? what's, what's really happening is that there's another, um, another variable, probably uh, just country infrastructure and general uh, wealth, that, uh, that increases cell phone usage and increases life expectancy through things like having uh, healthcare infrastructure and things like that. So another variable. So all of our examples for t-tests so far, um, we've really only talked about what we call non-directional tests. Okay. So uh, in a t-test, we have our null hypothesis, which we have mu1 minus mu2 is equal to zero, and then the alternative, mu1 minus mu2, uh, something equals zero, right? Does not equal zero, all right? So if it does not equal zero, not equal to zero, this is known as a non-directional test. Okay, and in this case, um, it doesn't matter uh, which group we label group one and which group we label group two, okay? Because if I do group one minus group two, I'm gonna get some kind of difference. It's either gonna be positive or it's gonna be negative, okay? And we don't care. If it's not zero, that's a, that's a difference of interest to us, okay? Other times, we're only interested if, um, if one group is larger than the other or one group is smaller than the other, okay? So sometimes, We are not interested in a simple difference. control group and a group that receives the weight loss drug, or a placebo group and a group that receives the, the actual drug, at the end of our study, the group with the actual drug have better weigh less or lost, lost weight compared to the control group, okay? If, uh, if we see just the opposite effect, then, uh, then there's no point in doing this uh, and even trying anything, okay? So we're really only interested in one, a, a single direction, okay? And so we call these directional tests, all right? So in that case, we've got HA, either mu1 minus mu2 is less than zero, or um, HA, uh, mu1 minus mu2 greater than zero, okay? And so at, when, we, when you change, when now you have a directional test, the labeling of the groups is very important now, okay? Now it depends which one, which group you call group one, and which group you call group two. You can't just um, just have them uh, swoops, uh, swap. Okay. So these are directional.
process with a directional test is almost the exact same for a non-directional t-test, okay? Except at the beginning we do uh, a common sense test or a common sense check, or uh, the book calls it checking directionality. But this is a, uh, I just call it a, a common sense check. And then uh, at the end, when we look it up in the, uh, the t-table, we don't do any doubling uh, to get our p-value. Okay, so uh, process for a directional t-test is uh, just like a non-directional test. Two percent between two percent and uh, zero or point zero two five, and then when we doubled it, it was four over four yep. or five. So now that we have those two numbers, you would just leave it at p values between two and two and a half percent. Okay, rather than saying that p values between four. And okay, so here uh, what they uh, are testing is if uh, I guess we. Uh, We've got group one uh, and group two.
collect my data. All right, so if, uh, if Y1 bar ends up being 11.0 um, pounds and Y2 bar ends up being 11.5 pounds, uh, then what? Do I have evidence to support the alternative? Yeah. Yeah, they're different. Wait, Y1 minus no. No. Okay. Because this is this is the common sense check. What I want to know is, does niacin help lambs gain weight? Okay. And what I found is that group one, the lambs yeah. that have been eating niacin, their weight ends up being less than the control group. Okay. So am I going to have evidence that niacin helps lambs gain weight? Mm -hmm. The answer is going to be no. All right. So clearly, I'm not going to have any evidence here. So at this point, I'm definitely not rejecting my p-value. So if this happens, okay, happens, uh, I clearly do not have evidence. Y1 bar equals 14, and Y2 bar ends up equaling 10. Do I have evidence that niacin helps lambs gain weight? Maybe, maybe. Okay. Enough, I mean, enough to pass. Yeah, common sense. enough to pass our common sense test. We don't know if this for sure proves, or uh, is enough evidence to say niacin helps gain weight. But uh, at least now we're going in the right direction, and now we do a statistical test to see if the difference here is significant or if it's not. Okay. Okay. Now we do a test to see if the difference is significant. difference we observe, y1 bar minus y2 bar, we observe a difference of 4 pounds, and we want to know, uh, is, this, is this significant? Okay? So, uh, you know, you have some S1 and N1 and an S2 and an N2, and you plug all of those things in to find your standard error, right? You get your standard error y1 bar minus y2 bar, this is the square root, s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. Okay, you, you plug all of these things in, and uh, let's just uh, skip through all of this, and let's say we get our standard error is 2.2 pounds. Is it always zero? Yes. Uh, in this equation, it's always going to be zero. Yeah. But it's uh, I put that in there just to give you the idea that we're we're trying to figure out how far we are from the mean. But I mean, if if you're trying to test the null, then uh -huh. you're always going to put zero. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
and their null is always going to have a zero. All right, so at this point, I'm centered at zero, and I've got a cutoff line at 1.82, and I want to know uh, what's the probability uh, of being out there. Um, According to this, uh, we looked at, uh, I guess, a total of 20 lands, and I've got 18 degrees of freedom. Okay, so whatever N1 and N2 are, so probably 10 and 10. I have degrees of freedom, 18. So I go to my T table, and I look up the row 18 degrees of freedom. And I'm looking for where 1.82 fits in that, uh, in that row. So 1.82 with 18 degrees of freedom. The relevant numbers, I'm in between 1.734 and 1.855. And 1.734 corresponds to tail probability of 0.05. This corresponds to tail probability of 0.04. So uh, 1.82 is in between there. So my tail probability is going to be in between 0 0.04 and 0 0.05, corresponding tail probability. So whatever this area is, I don't know exactly what it is, but I do know it's between 0 0.04 So this is the difference between a non-directional and a directional test. A non-directional test, you would be doubling this to get your p-value. But because it's directional, we do not double it. So our p-value is just going to be straight up point, between 0.04 and 0.05. Whatever it is, it's less than 0.05, but bigger than 0.04. So if alpha is 0 0.05, what is my conclusion? Do I reject or not reject? If alpha is 0 0.05. Yeah, it's not enough. No. So if alpha is 0 0.05, my p-value is less than alpha. Okay. So whenever my p-value is less than alpha, I reject the null. Okay. So if my alpha is 0 0.05, if I want what 5% type 1 error, I, I would my p-value is less than 0 0.05, so I reject the null, and that means I conclude that niacin makes a difference in, in uh, weight gain. That niacin helps lambs gain more weight. On the other hand, if my alpha, if my alpha is one percent, or if my alpha is two percent, okay, alpha is two percent, then what? Then you don't have enough. Uh, yeah. To if my alpha is two percent, my p-value is larger than alpha, so I do not reject the null, and I say I do not have evidence that niacin helps gain weight. Okay, so uh, I think this is worth writing out, all of this, so I'll, I'll put this up on the board, but I just want to make sure we're okay with this p-value and alpha, alpha distance, okay? So again, oh, I should have left that up there. Could you explain what beta was? Uh, yeah, so let, let me, let me uh, write this stuff first, okay? So our null is that mu1 minus mu2 equals zero, and the alternative, mu1 minus mu2 is greater than zero, which in English is niacin helps gain weight. Okay, so if this is my p-value, 0 0.04 between 0 0.04 and 0.05, okay, so if p-value, I'm sorry, if alpha is equal to 0.05, my p-value 
value is less than alpha, which means um, I reject the null hypothesis. And this means uh, I have evidence. significant enough to make the, uh, the significant. I'll, I'll just say it's significant. Okay, so um, the difference of four pounds observed, four pounds uh, between the samples is significant. Okay, at alpha equal to 0.05. Right. On the other hand, if alpha equals 0 0.02, my p value is greater than alpha. Okay? That means I do not reject the null hypothesis. I do not have evidence that uh, niacin helps uh, weight gain. Right. Or in other words, the difference of four pounds is not significant. to digest, okay? But you want to make sure that you can do this p-value bigger than alpha, p-value less than alpha. What conclusion do I make? What did, what implications does that have? Um, that's what matters, okay? So you see that um, by picking a different alpha, um, your conclusion could be uh, could be completely opposite one another, okay? And, uh, and again, alpha is, you know, how much of a risk are you willing to take for a type 1 error, okay? So in this case, what would a type 1 error be? Type 1 error that is true, but you reject it. Uh -huh. So what does that mean? That it, it does help lose weight. No. It is true. What's true? Oh, it is what true is that true? it doesn't help them lose yeah. weight. So the null hypothesis is true, okay? So type 1 errors, the null hypothesis is that um, niacin makes no difference in weight gain, okay? And so it means that it, it makes no difference, but you conclude that it does. It uh, uh, makes no difference, right. Okay. So in this case, a type 1 error is that niacin makes no difference, but you come to the conclusion that it does, okay? So if you pick... If you're willing to take a 5% risk of a type 1 error, then you would make the, uh, you would come to the conclusion that niacin makes a difference, okay? But if you're not willing, if you're not comfortable with a 5% error rate, okay, and you want to have less of an error rate, then you wouldn't make that conclusion. You're, you're saying, well, no, I don't have enough evidence to make this conclusion that it, that it makes it weight gain, okay? Because type 1 error is that you think it makes a difference in weight gain, but in reality, it doesn't. Okay. So what's what's a bigger uh, I don't know what's what's a bigger mistake here? Uh, making the uh, the wrong conclusion that it, it does make a difference in weight gain or doesn't. Okay. Maybe that's associated with how much niacin costs. Maybe uh, uh, you know maybe niacin is really cheap. So um, so if you make a type one error, it's no biggie, right? If niacin is really cheap and it actually doesn't make a difference. Um, but you think it does, and if it's really cheap, who cares, right? Now, now all the, the lambs are getting niacin. It's 
not making a difference, but it's not costing you anything. But maybe on the other hand, niacin is really expensive, okay? And so, uh, so you don't want to invest in this thing. Or maybe there's a, a, other problems with niacin, okay? And in that case, then, um, then you don't want to make a type 1 error. And so you, you pick the lower one. Okay? So your choice of alpha depends on the implications of what kind of error it is. And you can see how choosing a different alpha, you come to different conclusions. So this is a, I don't know, the double-edged sword of hypothesis testing. Uh, type, type 2 error is beta? Type 2 error is beta, yes. Okay, so the uh, probability of making a type 2 error is beta, okay? And, uh, and in this case, type 2 error would be niacin actually helps gain weight, but, uh, but, in, but you conclude that it doesn't. Okay, I think, uh, I think that's it. We'll, uh, we'll stop there. Is, is this okay? All right, so you guys have some homework exercises um, and, uh, to, to test this out. Uh, work through the homework. Uh, I hope uh, it helps sink, get this all sunk in. It.